Hello, and welcome to Conversations with Matt. In the last episode, we looked at chapter 1, verse 9, through the first half of verse 10, and talked about walking with God. The idea is to actually know God. This begins with God revealing things about himself to us so that we can know about God. Then it continues with us living according to those things that he told us to do, things which, by the way, reflect his nature. So when we do those things, we not only get to know God better, but we start to look more like him as well. So knowledge about God leads to being able to walk or live correctly, which leads to knowing God and reflecting him. Now the question that we should be asking is, what does it actually look like to walk correctly? In other words, what is the cash value of this? What does it actually look like in everyday life? How do we get from A to B so that we can know God? We're going to focus on the last half of verse 10 through verse 12 today, which will answer that question. I'm going to start reading at the beginning of verse 10 so we can get our place. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Now that all sounds really nice, but what's it mean? Well, in trying to understand what it means, I should point out that there are four participles in these verses that we need to pay attention to. The participle is a verb used as an adjective. You don't really need to know that. We're not going back to English class, so everybody can just chill out, take a breather, and relax. All you need to know is there are four things, which are called participles, that explain what walking in a manner worthy of the Lord looks like. Now, that's the end of our grammar discussion, so let's look at what things actually mean. The first two participles are bearing fruit and increasing. Well, these two go together. This isn't actually the first time we've seen these in Colossians, though. In verse 6, it was the word of truth, the gospel, that was bearing fruit and increasing. Here, what we see is that the Colossians are being compared with the gospel. The gospel is a big part of the way God reveals himself to the world. Now what we're seeing is that the Colossians are to be part of God's revelation as well. First, they receive revelation in 1.9, and now they share it in 1.10. This has a big impact for Christians. What it means is we are meant to be one of the ways that people see God. Here we're seeing that the way we represent God is paralleled to the way that the gospel represents God. And that should scare you and motivate you. The truth is people decide whether or not to accept a person's message based on the person. Are we the kind of people worth following? Do we reflect God? Chances are not well enough. So what are we going to do about it? And that's really the question that we all have to answer. I can tell you what Paul says is a way to lead a worthy life, one that will make God pleased. But only you can decide whether you're actually going to do what it takes to live that life or just sit back and coast. Your call. Moving on. Notice the parallel with Genesis which has be fruitful and multiply. Here we're talking about being fruitful and increasing. And we're going to talk further about what these terms mean, but we should take note that we're looking at something that is foundational to human existence. It goes all the way back to creation. We're getting at the question of what humans are supposed to do with their lives. We also see that bearing fruit is further explained as occurring in every good work. It's important to notice that the moral dimension is not detached from the intellectual. Morality really is about how we live out our beliefs. It's not some detached thing. It refers to the practical, everyday living that most of us are interested in. What does this mean to me and my everyday life? What we're going to see is that beliefs and actions are connected, and we're going to talk more about this in just a second. Finally, we see that increasing is further explained as happening in the knowledge of God. Remember our discussion in the last episode about the knowledge about God and knowledge of God? 
What we see here with bearing fruit and increasing, combined with our discussion in the last episode, takes us to two things that we really need to talk about. One, the interaction between beliefs and actions. And two, what I call the spiral. Okay, beliefs and actions. It was really common among ancient moral teachers to connect these two things. This wasn't something unique to Christians. Uh, It was something that was used throughout the ancient world. Morality refers to what you do and how you live, and this is based on our beliefs, whether consciously or not. What we're basically doing is imagining the interrelationship between theory and practice. So imagine, if you will, a gymnast trying to learn a complicated motion. Uh, The person's coach might explain to him or her, okay, this is how you do this, this is how you do this particular flippy-do, and say, try it like this. And the gymnast is going to have sort of a head knowledge or, or sort of a mental image of this is how I'm supposed to do this particular thing. But it's only once the gymnast tries to do the motion that he's going to have a idea of how it actually works in practice. Of course, doing it in practice also helps to understand how a thing is supposed to work. Understanding the theory leads to the best attempt that a person can make. Practicing it helps one to actually make the attempts better and to perfect what you're doing, but it also brings you back to understanding how it's supposed to work in theory better. So practice doesn't actually change the physics, but it does help the gymnast understand the physics better. Knowledge of God's will is basically the same as this example that we just used with a gymnast. Theory is knowledge of God's will. Living morally is practicing what you have learned. Living morally helps you not only to understand God himself better, but also to understand the theory better. The reason it does both is because, in this case, the theory is based on God's own nature. Okay, let's talk about the spiral. What we've been talking about lends itself to the idea of going around and around in a circle, back and forth between theory and practice, between God's will and the moral life. However, this doesn't really result in a circle, but a spiral. If this were a circle, we'd wind up in the same place we started. Rather, this is more like a spiral because what we do is we end up in a higher place than when we began. The idea is you go around and around the spiral and you end up a little bit higher each time you do it, and the more revolutions you make, the higher you end up. The way this happens is this. You start by knowing something about God's will. He reveals it to you. Now, you have a choice. Do you act on it or not? If you act on it positively, then you learn and grow and you know something more about God's will. You end up in a higher place than when you started. However, there is also a downward spiral. If you know something about God's will and choose not to act on it, you choose to ignore it for whatever reasons, this forms the opposite spiral and you end up in a lower place than when you started. So basically, there really is no way to stay still. You're either going up or down. So the progression or regression of man centers around two different things, knowledge of God's will and how we respond to that knowledge. Now, if you notice, there's only one of those two things that we can control. God is responsible for giving us knowledge. We can't do anything about that. Our responsibility is to act on that knowledge. So our progression or regression, our spiral up or spiral down, depends on how we respond to God. So those are the first two participles. The last two come in verses 11 to 12, which say, Being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience, with joy giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Okay, so third one, being strengthened. If you'll notice, this is passive. Previously, we talked about the use of passive in the New Testament. We saw that the passive voice is often used to refer to God. So what we see here is that the strengthening is not something we do on our own. We we don't strengthen ourselves. God is the one who strengthens us. It is the strength from God that gives us the ability to have endurance and patience. Now, there is a final bit at the end of this verse that says, with joy. 
I think this actually makes better sense attached to the following verse, explaining why, though, it would take us beyond what's helpful to understand right now. Remember, though, that the verse numbers are artificial. They're not original. They were added later. So sometimes chapter divisions and verse numbers don't always make the best sense, and you should view them as suggestions. This, I think, is one of those times, but it's not going to change the meaning of the passage a whole lot either way you read it. So, fourth participle, giving thanks. We spent a lot of time talking about Thanksgiving when we looked at verse 3 in the last series. Remember that I told you that it's important? Well, here you see it again. And not only does it show up again, it's one of the four parts of what the Christian life is supposed to be about. Thankfulness, as we talked about before, is based on what God has done for us. Here Paul reminds the Colossians to be thankful for what God has done for them, specifically qualifying them to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, the idea about God qualifying the Colossians has quite a lot behind it, and this gets into the whole question of what exactly it is that God has done for us. And that takes us beyond where we're going to get today, but we're going to get into that in the next episode. Before we conclude, though, let's take another look at these four participles, what they mean, and how they summarize or describe the Christian life. According to Paul, we should be bearing fruit in the same way that the gospel bears fruit. We should be making a positive impact on other people's lives. We should be reflecting God to people who don't know him, and for that matter, people who do know him. We should be increasing in the knowledge of God. Remember how we talked about the interaction between knowledge and beliefs? We saw that each one of these reinforces the other. As we know more about God's will, we should be putting it into practice. As we put in the practice, we learn more about God and progress upwards on the spiral. We should be made stronger to be able to endure and be patient through all the things that come into our lives. Obviously, that means not everything is going to be good or pleasing. The comforting thing, though, is that this strength comes from God. He is the one who makes us stronger. Finally, we should be thankful for everything that has been done for us. As I mentioned already, I'm not going to be giving a lot of details on this one right now because this is going to be the subject of the next episode and there's quite a lot here. So next time we're going to take a look at the last half of verse 12 and carry on to the end of verse 14 and talk about the actions of God. Before we end though, if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, please rate it on iTunes and write a review so that people know whether this podcast is for them or not. And if you've been enjoying it, please consider sharing a link to it with a friend. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next week.